August 23rd, 2023, and this is your morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, can you please call the roll? Good morning. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Ryan. Here. Wheeler. Here. Okay, thank you, Keelan. We'll now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Hi, Lindley. Good morning, Commissioner Ryan. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with the city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, <coughs> state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify oh, sure. it. For testifiers sure. joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you, Lindley. First up is communications. Uh, Keelan, can you please call the first item 689? Request of Elaine Mildenberger to address council regarding Columbia Park Pools. Elaine, come right up. Good to see you. Uh, sit in the middle chair if you can. And I'm sure the mics are working now, right? And when you begin speaking, you have three minutes. Welcome. Pardon? Oh, when you all have three minutes when you begin speaking. Good to see okay, you. Well, give me about three and a half. <laughs> so I've come to speak about the uh, Columbia Park pools that were closed for um, not sure what reason. So it's caused a lot of stress in the community, and it's put way too much stress on the only two remaining uh, pools in North Portland, which is Peninsula and Pier Park. Um, a friend of mine that has five grandchildren, his three oldest can swim, one's a lifeguard, the two youngest can't. When he can, he drives to the Milwaukee Elks, which is a ways. So I feel that a cruel mistake was made by the previous council, and myself and many others are imploring you to reverse their decision. So. So now we talk about the aquatic center to be built in the next six, six, seven, eight years with the budget right at 50 million, which of course over time will increase. People will love it and use it, but right now it's pie in the sky and the Columbia Park community is asking why their community is being told it's their sacrifice that's needed um, so that another community can community can have what our community is being denied. It just doesn't seem fair, it's not just. In 2020, we overwhelmingly passed Measure 26-213 that specifically was to prevent cuts to park programs and to prevent community centers and pools from being closed. In 2022, we overwhelmingly voted to keep that program going again. It's between uh, 45, 50 million dollars a year People voted, that means something. All of the uh, uh, homeowners are paying hundreds of dollars a year through their taxes for, for this program, but the pools were closed anyway. How does that work? It just seems like the vote means nothing. So North Portland has Pier Park at the far north end of the community of St. John's, <coughs> and the next pool is in Peninsula Park, miles away. Contrary to what we voted in, the Columbia right in the middle, the pools were closed. 
Many would benefit if these pools were repaired and reopened, even if it meant without a roof. So please put your heads together and make this work. So since the St. John's Review article came out, which you're all going to be provided with, I've been provided with a copy of the Com Community Task Force Facility Assessment. The report indicated that the mechanical systems are sound and serviceable, with the exception of an assessment of the roof structure. So I would like the city to review the task force report and implement its recommendations. So a while back, a statement came out that said, for too long our kids have had to leave their community in order to have the amazing opportunities that others have readily available. I must add, our Columbia pool facility must be repaired and maintained. The concept of deferred maintenance must be removed from the city's vernacular. So thank you all for uh, listening to this and please make this work. There's a lot of people depending on you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine Milderberger. Good to have you here. And I'm glad that you're connecting with Ken Rumbaugh. Uh, Ken is uh, connecting with you. Ken knows all things about pools in Portland Parks and Rec. And I do think we need to get to the bottom of what the actual expense is. And I think that's what's coming out really clearly is we need to communicate exactly what it is. So I appreciate you bringing uh, this to the dais. And I know when Commissioner Rubio made this decision prior to me having this assignment, it was a tough one. And I've just, I have been focusing on the future, which you mentioned, the North Portland Aquatic Center. And I understand what you're saying. I see the long lines at Pier Park and Peninsula due to this closure. It is a sacrifice. And I thank you for being here. And so Ken and you are connected, right? Yes. Okay, that's helpful. All right, thank you. Next item is 690. Colleagues, was there any other comments on this? Okay, 690, please. Request of Jess Pipkin to address council regarding gun violence in Southeast neighborhood. Jess was planning to join online. Um, they haven't arrived. Is Jess Pipkin here? Okay, why don't we go to 691 then? Mm -hmm. 691, request of Addie Smith to address council regarding racism and discrimination. Addie is joining us online. Welcome, Addie, I see you online. Please unmute. You have three minutes. Sorry about that. It's okay, um, welcome. Thank you. Hello, council. My name is Addie Smith. I'm speaking before you today to raise awareness about the importance of putting an end to the bigotry systemic and structural racism and discrimination happening to young black men like my son Jalen in this state by the police and by courts like Multnomah and Washington County, for example, and by those people that work in the me building. Stop. I'm telling you all to tell your white friends, neighbors, and colleagues to stop. I'm reaching out to you all here because if it doesn't end, because if it doesn't end, you're going to see more and more black mothers like me who will not go to the polls and continue to support Democrats like President Biden, Jeff Merkley, Ron Wyden, Julie Fahey and yourself, and some of those on the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. I know you all think that there is a lesser of two eagle, evils in this political party, but there isn't. I'm telling you that there isn't, and that if you have to, and if I have to keep asking, that work be done to stop the discrimination, the systemic and structural discrimination by your judges and by your police. You're going to see a world, a United States that you don't want to see by Republicans that are showing you their racism. Oregon, Washington State, and California are more racist than what we have seen in the South. And it is time for the media to start publishing about what is being allowed to happen in these states. I don't see a lot of that happening. And I can give you an example of that. I can tell you about judges who are watching child porn from their benches in Washington County. That didn't make national news. 
It did not. And he was allowed to leave jail on his own recognizance by Chief Judge Kathleen Proctor. Meanwhile, young black men who are accused by ex-girlfriends who, when, for example, my son broke up with this girl and she lied to the police that he had hurt her and he simply would not allow her into his home, his home, not her home. And he wasn't given a bond that he could afford because she went to the police and lied. And then the courts took it from there. But those same courts allowed Judge Michael Mann to be to walk right out of jail on his own recognizance. And when AP Andrew Seltzer, the only person who reported about what happened, reported that he was allowed to walk out of the jail, Judge Proctor had him come back and, and pay $2,000 so he'd go home and sit at home uh, and watch more child porn until his case started. You guys have got to do something about it. I'm going to come back and see you again. Thank you so much, Addie. Thanks for being here. Comments. Okay, we'll move on to the next um, test. Yeah, did you have I'm a comment? I, I just wanted to note first. Addie, hold on to uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Ms. Smith, uh, if you could. Yeah. Portland City Council has no jurisdiction over Multnomah or Washington County Circuit Court, so uh, we have no connection there. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mr. Gonzalez. And I want to say this. You guys have lunch with these people. You guys talk with these people. You guys, there is communication that is happening. These are your colleagues. These are your friends. These are your neighbors. These are your peers. Conversations are happening, and we know that they are. So while I appreciate your response, you know that that response is just an excuse to allow that sort of behavior to continue. Meanwhile, you want us to continue to put people like Biden in office when you have people like Jeff Merkley saying things like SCOTUS needs ethics. And I want to give you an example, and I'm just going to just briefly say this, okay? I have filed complaints against judges in Multnomah County and Washington County, for example. And I received a response from Rachel Mortimer, who is the executive director at the Commission on Judicial Conduct. And her excuse to me was she couldn't hold these judges accountable because she doesn't have enough funding in the budget. There are too many excuses for systemic and structural racism and discrimination. These are your friends. Sure. These are your neighbors. You guys have to do something about it. Or you're going to see a country that you don't want to see. No one wants DeSantis to be president, but guess what? If I continue to have to deal with my son being discriminated against, that's what we're gonna get. Because there is no lesser of two evils. So yes. it's either all of Addie, us are gonna suffer, Addie, thank or you. none of us are gonna suffer. Thank you so much, and your passion and your point is so well taken. And yes, we do always need to work with our colleagues who also have governance roles throughout the system. So I really appreciate your, your voice today. Thanks for being here. If we could go on now to 692. Um, 692 and 693 have requested to present together. May I read both of them? Great. Okay, great. <clears throat> 692, request of Stanley Pinkin to address council regarding Home Share Oregon. And item 693, request of Ali Parzik to address council regarding Home Share Oregon. Great. Welcome, Stanley and Ali. We'll uh, go ahead and give you six minutes total. And the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony in support of city funding for Home Share Oregon. My name is Stan Penkin, and I am the chair of Home Share Oregon. Sorry I cannot be with you in person today, but our development manager, Ali Parsich, is. Our mission is to increase access to affordable housing through home sharing. What began as a small program has exploded into a proven way to expand access to low-income housing, while also building financial resilience for some of our most vulnerable homeowners. Home Share Oregon is an upstream approach to preventing homelessness. Statewide, we have over 1,200 homeowners registering to rent their space, spare bedrooms, and about 3,000 home seekers trying to find affordable housing. The average rent for renters in our program is $750 to $800. 
$1,000 less than current market rate in urban centers, and also less than the rent for more traditional low-income housing. Our goal is to empower homeowners and housemates to successfully execute the home sharing program model. Home share is a proven response to increasing access to affordable housing. The reality is that we cannot build ourselves out of our housing crisis anytime soon. But by effectively utilizing the untapped existing inventory, we can house people quickly and without the enormous cost and time it takes to build new housing. Home share programs are currently being funded by local municipalities in Ohio, New York, Boston, California, Vermont, Maine, and more. Last year, Home Share Oregon received a $250,000 grant to pilot our program in Multnomah County with 1.5 FTE and targeted public education advice. The particip participation in the program increased 49%. The grant was allocated in late July and hiring, hiring was completed in early September. In less than nine months, 83 people were placed at an average cost of $3,000 per person served. Upon completion of the pilot, Home Share, in partnership with the PSU School of Business Capstone Project, evaluated our success, which included a participant survey and identification of any barriers to using the program effectively so we can respond and improve where needed. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, you all know that I'm involved in many things across this city. Of all my involvements, home share is closest to my heart and something at which I'm extremely passionate and it is having a significant impact. I hope you can help us increase <clears throat> that impact. I will now hand this over to Howie. Welcome, Allie. Hi. Thanks for being here. Good morning. My name is Allie Parzik, and I am the development manager at HomeShare Oregon. Um, thank you for allowing me to provide a continuation of an overview of our organization this morning. So as Stan mentioned, barriers to the use of our program centered on technological limitations by participants, as well as staffing challenges to meet participant demand. So 27% of our homeowners signed up for the program because they were mortgage burdened. 19% uh, signed up because they wanted to support affordable housing in their communities. 73% were over the age of 55. 63% were women. 53% received social security benefits. 26% were from BIPOC communities and 34% of all participants had either experienced homelessness or housing insecurity. So this data reinforced our thesis that home sharing is preventing foreclosure and building financial resilience while also providing low income housing. Today, we are requesting 1 million per year for the next two years to fund a tech upgrade and five FTEs with administrative support to increase homeowner participants by 30% in the city of Portland. This will allow us to meet current participation demand, enhance our data tracking system, increase public education efforts, and recruit more homeowners and provide the much needed shelter for many in need in the city. HomeShare Oregon understands there is no more cost-effective solution to expanding access to affordable housing than home sharing. While continued investments need to be made in housing production, this cannot be the only approach as it is supports antiquated policies which created the supply demand issue we are currently facing today. The vision, a home for everyone, needs to evolve and expand so we can expand um, respond successfully to the current crisis. We can't build a home for everyone, but we can expand access significantly to housing by putting to work the underutilized housing stock currently available. We are asking for the city's support so we can better serve our participants, aggressively target the city of Portland for expansion, and increase homeowner participation by 30%. Home sharing is the most cost-effective approach to affordable housing crisis, which has contributed to the rising number of displaced people. We are an upstream organization, as Stan mentioned, preventing homelessness as well as foreclosure before it happens. Thank you. 
for your consideration. We look forward to getting to know each of you and understanding how our relationship can grow stronger in years to come. <laughs> thank you so much, Ali. Uh, colleagues, any questions, comments? Ali, I just want to thank you both, both you and Stan, for being here. I, I have to say, in real time, it hit me how this benefits also the homeowner. I haven't heard that testimony with such clarity before. And I want to just also mention how important it is that we always look at different strategies for different types of people who are homeless. I often use the example of my brother who was chronically homeless, who had triple diagnosis and was suffering, <clears throat> and he wasn't really houseable. He needed services to help with mental health and behavioral health services before they would move into a studio apartment, for example. And I don't think any of the homeowners would have wanted them in their home at that time. However, my mother, who was on fixed income and had some health issues, was suddenly in a crisis of being, could have been homeless. Luckily, there was an organic system at her church in San Diego where she was able to pay way below market. So it really was kind of this system without having a great agency like you involved. So I do hope that we continue to look at different strategies for different types of folks who are on the verge of being homeless. I do have a question. Have you been working with the joint office at the county to get into their budget? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to hear that. Okay, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for putting that out. And I'm sure you're also talking to our partners at the county, correct? All right. Yes to that, Dan, uh, Commissioner. Oh, hello, Stan. I didn't hear what you said. Uh, I said yes to that. We are uh, talking to the joint office and the county as well. Great, great. Well, wonderful presentation. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay, Keelan, let's move on to consent. I think there's one item that's being pulled off. Uh, item 700. Okay. All right, so with that being pulled off consent, please call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Okay, great. Our first time certain <clears throat> is somewhere in here. 694. Thank you. So, please read 694. Accept Outdoor Dining Program Design Guidelines Report. Welcome. Commissioner Ryan, this is me. Um, uh, we, we, I'm going to hand this over to Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Maps, please take it away. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Transportation. As you know, since the pandemic, many restaurants in Portland have added outdoor dining options in the public right of way. The report before us today proposes two things. First, this report recommends that the city's outdoor uh, dining program be made permanent. And second, this report proposes updates to the rules that govern the design and placement of tables, chairs, and dining sheds in the public right of way. Now, the goal of these guidelines is to improve safety and accessibility in the public right of way, while also supporting businesses and neighborhood vitality. This report does not create any new financial burdens for the city or business owners. However, next month, council will review proposed adjustments to the fee schedule for the city's outdoor dining program. Uh, here today, we have some staff from PBOT, including Art Pierce, Policy Planning and Projects Group Director for PBOT. We also have David McEldowney, uh, Right-of-Way Management and Permitting Division Manager with PBOT. And we have Sarah Figliozzi, a uh, Public Realm and P Street Activation section manager at Peabot. Uh, welcome, Peabot. Uh, um, take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, Art Pierce, Director of Policy, Planning, and Projects at Peabot. I'm very pleased to bring uh, this item before you today. Um, uh, what we're presenting today is uh, specific guidelines for the uh, outdoor dining program um, and really to move this towards a more uh, consistent and um, predictable program. Um, as, as you may recall, during COVID, um, we opened up street uses to a whole variety of, of opportunities, and this was one that uh, business owners really um, valued and really was a lifeline for our economic uh, resiliency during the, the, uh, the period. Um, but it's becoming uh, an expected part and a, and a, a really uh, um, enjoyed part of our civic life here in Portland. Um, and in particular, I want to thank uh, Council as we're heading into this. Um, this wouldn't have been possible if Council hadn't allocated ARPA funds 
to support us through this period, both supporting businesses and subsidizing the cost of this program, um, but also uh, supporting the, the undertaking of this study and the staff work that is taking to, to now create a, a program that I think will, will be evergreen and, and lasting for many years. Um, so next slide. Um, but I think a key question, um, why is PBOT doing this? And I think it's really important for us to remember that streets make up about 40% of the land in our city. Um, it is uh, a, a set of real estate that we have a, a set of options to, de to deliberate on and can make policy choices about what's best for the mobility needs for the city as well as the economic and uh, civic life of the city. Um, and uh, we think that this is an opportunity for PBOT and for the city to really show its values, um, particularly in bringing community back together um, after a number of hard years. Um, public space is how a community embodies its, uh, its culture, its connection. Uh, someone went to the Flaming Lips last night and could see the, the excitement of everyone uh, here at Pioneer uh, uh, Square and knowing that that um, needs to happen throughout the city. We need to be able to create places, particularly as we densify uh, our streets and our communities, that there is places for connection, places for dialogue, places to see people that are similar to you and also people that are different from, from you. And there's the choices that we can make about how we allocate street space is part of our public policy choice for how we are creating a, a culture and a community. And particularly, I think, after three hard years, this is an opportunity for us to produce spaces and opportunities for a community to come together and find connection um, and resilience as we are um, sort of remaking Portland in this post-pandemic era. Um, out of the myriad of solutions that we were offering to uh, business and community throughout the, the, the pandemic, uh, the PBOT team has distilled this down into two long-term program proposals. Um, Street Plaza program, which we will be coming back uh, later on this, this uh, fall with more uh, details on how we propose to continue that program. And then what we're bringing to you today around the specifics of outdoor dining program, which is really primarily focused on the individual business relationships with, with a, a business or a couple businesses uh, along the street. So I'll, I'll pass this on to my colleagues who are gonna tell you more about the program. Thank you, City Council. Yeah. Um, so Sarah Figliozzi. You um, are all very familiar with the pro proliferation of outdoor dining during COVID, but Portland really has a long history in terms of allowing outdoor seating um, and in-street dining structures. We had a robust conversation about sidewalk rules in 2008 with a community. The creation of the street seat pilot program in 2012, Portland was one of the uh, first three major cities piloting parklets on the street. And then the adoption of Peabot's livable street strategy in 2017. So when the COVID hit, PBOT was really set up and prepared to be able to react quickly to provide options for businesses and a number of different permit options so that they could use the public right of way. And the response from the public was very overwhelmingly supportive and that continues today. You're one slide behind. Ah, I am, thank you. So this past spring, over 1,000 Portlanders told Peabot that outdoor dining was good for Portland. The survey asked about overall support for the program and also asked for opinions about key design changes or operational requirements. Over 80% of respondents said that they agreed that outdoor dining was good for Portland businesses and it was good for Portland neighborhoods. Can I ask a question on that slide? Yeah. Great, great numbers. Can you define community and who actually responded? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, it was an online survey that was done in April and May that was sent out to all of past permit holders okay. as well as current permit holders of our list. And then it was amplified um, out by the Street Trust to get community um, part participation. So the person well. targeted the small businesses for the most part that, that asked for the permits, the restaurants, and then it went beyond that? Okay. I would say the majority of responses actually came from community members. We had and the community was defined by the outreach that Street Trust did? Um, it was on partner. their list, but it was also sent out through the multiple ways in which okay. PBOT communicates out to our, right. our partners. Yeah. It's helpful when we know what the targeted audience is. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So as we 
talk about modifying this pandemic response program into a permanent program, it's really been a process of formalizing what has been working and then focusing in on those issues that we recognize need to be changed, what's not working. So by formalizing the program, PBOT will continue to issue sidewalk permits as well as in-parking lane permits. Um, however, based on feedback from city staff, from neighborhood, from business uh, partners, as well as our partner bureaus, um, we are recognizing, recommending um, a number of proposed revised design guidelines that address safety issues, clear permit holder responsibilities, and a PBOT enforcement strategy. This product also features our partner bureau comments, such as FIRE and BES to ensure that these guidelines meet their concerns, such as clearance to hydrants, clearance to building side water connections, um, ladder placement, issues around blocking stormwater swales. A bit um, on the design guidelines, which have you all have in your report packet. The new program does come with a new set of revised design guidelines, heavily focused on visual diagrams that explain critical clearance, accessibility, and dimension issues. While these screenshots are far too small for any of you to see, um, Mr. Members, this are page, pages 19 and 23 in the report, so you can see, see those details that are provided. So up close, you'll see that the pages provide detailed illustrations to businesses or their contractors to be able to understand items about where the installations can be located, minimum and maximum roof and wall heights, uh, clearance requirements from such items um, as the hydrants, utility access points, stormwater drainage dimensions, setbacks from Green Street facilities, et cetera. And we know that Portland streets must balance the needs of many competing uses, as well as the needs of our partner bureaus. And these guidelines attempt to address that balance. Many of the key changes in the new design guidelines are focused on safety issues and increased visibility, particularly at intersections. We want to ensure that bulky installations um, at corners don't block visibility of road users, that walls are low enough so, low enough so that people can see, can be seen when they're crossing the street, that roofs and umbrellas are not blocking the view of stop signs. And then other of the design changes are focused on accessibility, requiring that um, accessible platforms or ramps are required for year-long installations, and prohibiting over sidewalk structures to remove the sidewalk barriers, pinch points, um, ensuring that fire's ladder access is still available, and adding the added benefit of improving visibility of the neighbor uh, shop storefronts. The aesthetics of street seats have also been a theme in our public feedback. So while we know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we do believe that there are strategies that we can use to improve the aesthetics of these installations on our streets. Formalizing the program will support business owners who are looking for program permanence before they upgrade their installations. Providing platform design guidance on how to ensure clear gutters and stormwater drainage will minimize uh, pooling and blockages along the gutters. Clear articulation of owner maintenance responsibilities, such as removing graffiti, keeping installations free of debris, leaves, and litter will clarify roles. <coughs> And in later slides, we'll touch on incentives and financial support that Peabody is, is providing. During our interviews with restaurant owners, we heard a range of different operational and seasonal needs, as well as comfort with different price points. So as such, the revised program is designed to allow for that flexibility with the option of four different permit types with a range of prices. The new outdoor dining program will introduce a new permit option, a seasonal street seat, which will be available for businesses for seven months of the year. It will allow them to use lighter weight materials that will be easier to install, in, uh, to remove, and to store during the winter, and then at a lower price point. In 2024, the fees will range from $360 to $2,000 for an annual permit for a typical two parking spaces or 40 feet if it was a sidewalk seating. Um, but we will go into more detail on those on um, upcoming slides. And now I'm gonna pass it along to Dave who will talk about the important education, permitting, and enforcement strategies that his team works on. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. David McEldowney, right-of-way permitting, right-of-way management and permitting. Next slide. Um, the, this slide will give you a sense of the proposed um, 
timelines. During this last uh, winter and spring, we worked on the uh, outdoor dining uh, program and guidelines, proposed fees, and conducted public engagement. Uh, now in late summer, we're formalizing this work with report to city council and uh, we'll come back in on September 27th with rule and code changes. Um, with approval of the design guidelines and fees, the application window will open in mid-October and seasonal permit applications will open somewhere between January and February. Uh, additionally, we'll be providing outreach and education with uh, existing and past permit holders and the community at large, um, probably around the beginning of October, uh, with the goal of all existing installations being compliant by April of 2024. Uh, next slide. This is a good segue to talk about some strategies for encouraging compliance. Of approximately the 200 plus uh, street seats that are uh, out there today, we're estimating that at least 70% have compliance concerns. Uh, that's either through visibility or accessibility issues. Uh, the good news is that PBOT has tools to support them. Um, we'll be conducting targeted communications to businesses on requirements, resources, and timing. We'll have plans available for layout and construction of new installations, as well as lists of contractors who are able to assist with that work. Uh, PBOT will be using ARPA funds to subsidize a significant portion of the permit fees for the businesses that participate in the 24, 2024 permitting cycle. And lastly, we're happy to announce that PBOT will be using ARPA funds to set up a financial assistance program for businesses to create new year-round installations or bring existing installations into compliance. Next slide. Uh, to speak to that last point a little bit more, uh, the program will provide $2,500 in funding for up to 200 businesses participating in the year-round street seat installations. We anticipate that this will, program will capture more than 80% of the businesses participating in the 2024 permitting cycle. And it should be noted that the business support program will have priority for BIPOC businesses. Next slide. Um, in working through the various elements of the outdoor dining program, it was clear that businesses are facing challenging times, both economically and environmentally. It was apparent that not every situation would be able to be addressed through the design guidelines. In recognition of that, PBOT is developing both temporary and permanent program features to assist businesses wanting to participate in the program. Some flexibility on design guidelines, uh, compliance will be available for existing installations if they are not key safety uh, issues, and program staff will work with businesses to communicate uh, the exception process. While the design guidelines don't allow for locked spaces, some businesses expressed a desire to be able to secure their installations when not in operation due to negatively, um, or due to issues that negatively impact their business. PBOT is responding by temporarily allowing lock spaces during the period that the emergency declaration for coordinating efforts to clean public spaces is in place. Next slide. This slide is an example of typical fees for a 40 linear foot sidewalk cafe or two parking spaces. PBOT has been able to subsidize fees during COVID, um, during the COVID indoor dining restrictions and partially subsidized fees during the fiscal years 20, 2022 and 2023 using federal pandemic relief funds under the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. Permit fees for sidewalks or sidewalk and parking lane use are necessary for individual business support during application submittal, review of design plans, and site eligibility. Customer service, business education, and communication throughout the year compliance review and inspections and enforcement efforts. PBOT will be continuing to partially subsidize outdoor dining fees through 2024, slowly bringing rates back to, up to where they were prior to COVID for 2025. Next slide. And lastly, on September 27th, PBOT will bring back to council the necessary code and rule changes needed for the program to include the final fee schedule. And that concludes my portion.
Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner, any invited testimony? Yeah, I, be I believe we have uh, several folks who have been invited to testify today. I believe we're supposed to start out with our design chairs. Do we have uh, Brian McCarter, I think, in person? Hi, Brian, come on up. And then I think we should have uh, Vice Chair Chandra Robinson virtually. Thank you. Yeah, and then so just curious, Keelan, do we also here. have public testimony today on this report? Thank you, Commissioners, for... Okay. For the time here, I also have my colleague Chandra Robinson, our co-chair. Co and Chandra, you're there. Yeah, yeah, there she is. She's, She's on. on. Okay. So, we would just like to, as a commission, we want to give maximum kudos to Peabot for taking the initiative on this active street-based public realm in our city. Um, we got to review this on a presentation from um, Nick Falbo from Peabot. We made a few minor suggestions on design consistency and, and safety near in intersections, and they've responded pretty favorably to that. Next slide. We wanted to take this opportunity to make a, a few additional observations uh, today. Next slide. These types of uh, street interventions are most successful when they're in addition and as an enhancement to adjacent active uses in the ground floors of buildings. Um, next slide. Um, and these circumstances uh, with these street cafe patios and plazas are well represented around Portland. Um, and it makes sense if you think about it. You don't see great street cafe patios up, up against a building with no windows, no awnings, no good signage, none of that f street friendly stuff. So we think that there's a real tie between successful cafe patios and street plazas and good ground floors of buildings. Um, Chandra, you want to take the next slide? You bet. Um, thanks for having us. I'm really glad to get to be here to talk about what is really important about Portland. And, um, you know, what PBOT is doing with this new policy is really carving out new open space for community enjoyment. Um, next slide, please. The, the Design Commission really has a reciprocal responsibility in this endeavor. We ensure that the ground floor of adjacent buildings really floods the new street spaces with a vitality, with people, with activity. And that's really one of the things that makes Portland Port. Um, so next slide. A, a really sort of useful way maybe of thinking about this is that the parking lanes are used differently over time because of the flexibility in their design. Uses in the ground floor of buildings that the design commission will use can also evolve if their design anticipates that kind of change. So imagine having a taller ceiling height or more windows or weather protection and signage um, that directs people from those store entrances out to the street, vice versa. And all of those things really matter to kind of create this activity and vitality in the street. So in both ground floor and parking lanes, flexibility really means adaptability for the things that we don't know are coming in the future, like the changes that will come that we can't anticipate. Next slide. And then finally, as a reminder from out of state of the city, our state of the city that we did in March, this new mixed use project in Lentz was approved by the design commission in a single hearing because the developer and their architect understood and applied our zoning code and design guidelines to this really outstanding building with both ground floor retail and ground floor <coughs> residential. And so when this type of thing happens for developers and for designers, it really, we really think that it, it brings all the best things out of Portland and makes all of these streets the best for pedestrians and for cars and for people who are uh, living and working and recreating in those buildings. So thank you very much for giving us this time. Great. Thank you, Chandra. Great. Is that all for? Uh... Uh, actually, I believe we have more invited testimony okay. today. Um, uh, Kurt Hoffman. Do we have Kurt Huffman, Huffman in the room? Hey, Kurt, how you doing? Oh. And we have several, I, I might defer to staff here. We I think we have several restaurant owners. Should they come up um, in a group or should they come up one after another? We're all friendly. Um, I'm sorry? The list is on the slide. The list is on the slide, okay. 
I'm not sure what that means. Uh, solo or come on up. We'll we'll figure it out. And if we don't run out of chairs, we can do it in batches. Welcome. Uh, I'll let you just welcome Kurt. I'll let you start off, and uh, maybe we could start off with everyone introducing themselves, and then uh, um, you could each uh, make your presentation. Uh, my name is Kurt Huffman. I own a company called Chef Stable in Portland. We partner with and support about uh, 31 different restaurants locally, and then a new food cart pod. Great. And my name is Catherine Benvenuti, and I'm a former business owner in Portland who's representing Kelly Towner. I'll be one of her managers at a Southeast Clinton restaurant that'll be opening in October. Great. Uh, my name is Jasper Shen. I own a, a small restaurant in North Portland called XLB. Great. Mm. Um, tell us your story. Uh, I just wanted to talk about two specific aspects of the uh, proposed changes that I think are worth mentioning. Um, I think the, pro the progressive pricing structure uh, is important, especially for uh, downtown restaurants. Um, in the downtown core previously, anywhere there's metered parking, street seat fees were related to lost parking revenue, and this changes it. So uh, in this specific area, we have three restaurants we work with, and year on year, compared to 19 and now, it's the only area where we have restaurants where we're down an average of 20%. So the downtown core is still struggling. This kind of pricing uh, not only helps existing restaurants, but I think importantly, makes pricing more affordable to restaurants with lesser means who should have as much access to this kind of you know amenity for their guests as anybody else. Um, I think the second benefit just has to do with uh, safety and accessibility because the reduced fees allows these cart pods to have, for instance, to be ADA accessible, whereas before the design guidelines, or at least what became the interpretation of the design guidelines, uh, made it a little bit difficult for people in wheelchairs and so forth to access the, the platform. So uh, I think it has two principal uh, impacts that I think are a huge benefit. I'm, I'm going to read something um, from Kelly. Um, she's opening a restaurant in Southeast Clinton, and Kelly asked me to provide testimony with how important the proposed price, pricing structure is for the first-time restaurant owners like her. The proposed pricing will allow her to offer substantial outdoor seating at a reasonable budget, which is unbelievably important for the viability of her small business. Before working for Kelly, I was a small business owner in downtown Portland, and I eventually had to close my business due to the financial struggles of COVID and safety in downtown Portland. Restaurant op owners operate on razor-thin margins, and any extra financial support keeps restaurants throughout our city alive. The proposed pricing and permit options will make it easier for restaurant owners to afford outdoor seating and necessary annual maintenance and improvements to outdoor structures. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to just reiterate some of the things that these everybody has already said is the importance of the outdoor seating and the, the street seating and how it caught us through a very tough time with the pandemic. Uh, but even without the pandemic, uh, restaurants have always notoriously had razor thin margins and any, anything, any small bit that could make uh, extra revenue um, is super important to keeping restaurants alive, uh, having accessibility to new restaurants and helping create uh, vibrant neighborhoods and increasing tourism and business and housing and so many other things. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, colleagues, any questions? I, th I believe we, we have one more batch of uh, invited testimony. Yeah, I think we should get through the invited testimony okay. and go to public. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. Uh, Thank you. Excellent. I would ask the, the rest of the folks who uh, have been invited to testify to come on up today. Should I pull up a chair or wait for the... <laughs> uh, pull up a chair. We'll get you a chair. Always room for one more. Do you want to introduce first, oh, yeah. or one by one? Sure. When we, when we, when, just so we know who we're, who we're chatting with, why don't we start out by everyone uh, um, introducing so, yourselves, and then you can uh, take the, the presentation in whatever order makes sense. Okay. Uh, my name is Jessica Silverman. I'm a partner at Grasa. We have uh, three Portland locations in Northwest, Southwest, and Southeast. Great. I'm uh, Brian Steelman, and I'm a partner uh, with Porcino Taqueria. Great. 
Henry Miller, and I'm the uh, Director of Grants and Program Impact at the Street Trust. Hello, I'm Jay Clark, and I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Portland Metro Chamber, and I'm here today on behalf of our 2100 members. Great. Thanks for being here for today. Uh, and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Okay. Um, street seats have been crucially important to my business and other businesses like mine, both throughout the pandemic and now. The Grasso location at Southwest 12th and Washington likely would not have been able to survive the convergence of COVID and the vacancies downtown, if not for quick pivots to the healthy business program and clear communication by PBOT. For food and beverage businesses, each additional seat we can offer guests increases revenue potential exponentially. On top of that, street side visibility is one of the best forms of marketing. The outdoor dining program impacts both in a meaningful way, driving revenue to businesses, many of which are still working to get back to pre-pandemic levels. As you know, food and beverage costs have increased substantially over the last few years and continue to trend upward. And as operators, we're doing our best not to raise prices. The economics of street seats are unbelievably positive. PBOT's proposed pricing structure will allow us to divert funds that previously would have been earmarked for the permit fees to the structures themselves, ensuring roofs for year-round usage and investment in attractive spaces that add to the city's character. The proposed pricing, the varied offering from seasonal to year-round street seat options, and the educational and um, compliance resources will be especially impactful in maintaining the diversity of food and beverage offering, offerings in Portland, since these changes will allow smaller cafes and restaurants to be able to keep these seating areas when they otherwise would not be able to. From my perspective during the pandemic, PBOT was one of the most impactful agencies in responding quickly to offer solutions to allow us to operate in a time of uncertainty. I'm encouraged that PBOT continues to work to propose solutions to support the success of businesses in our city. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm gonna read something that I wrote. Um, reflecting back on 2020 and 2021 as a restaurant operator, there are very few things that pop up in my memory as victories. Being restaurants, we were not able to work from home or keep our windows boarded up like City Hall did for two plus years. We had to walk a very tenuous high wire act of keeping employees employed, but also safe without really knowing what that meant. We had to evolve insanely fast to keep our businesses alive. And three years later, for restaurants that were able to survive, this has led to some wonderful changes in the way many restaurants operate, including online ordering, better pay and working conditions for employees, more efficiency, and many other positive changes. But operating in real time in 2020 and 2021, there were not silver linings. It was purely survival mode and working through fears. Every week there were new restrictions, variants, wildfires, etc. We darkly joked about what the shit sandwich was going to be that week. One of the few bright and innovative positives during that time was PBOT having the flexibility and courage to open up the healthy business permits. This was the type of progressive thinking we needed from our city. I think we as residents of the city all realized how important our local retail shops and restaurants are to the fabric of our city when many of us had to shut down for a few weeks or months during COVID. The vibrancy of the city was gone. These small businesses clawed the city back to life and Peabot helped make that possible. Now, most of the residents in Portland love the feel of the increased vibrancy that the street seats bring to our city, making it feel more alive. We need assurance that this program will last into the future. There is no doubt that many structures need to be improved, both structurally and visually. At Porcino, we literally had a tent for two plus years, which was not the most attractive thing to look at on Mississippi Avenue. We did finally build something beautiful recently that fits all the new guidelines and enhances the street, allows for a better ADA patio seating, and is safe. To do this, we had to spend a lot of money, and therefore, it feels very important to have assurance that this program will not be cut in the near future. As businesses, we often need to make budget decisions looking at the next five or 20 years, not the next single year. So please consider lengthening the time period that this program is greenlit. It has already been three years that the street seats has been allowed and the sky has not fallen. In fact, it is one of the things that added vibrancy and safety to our city during a time when there has been a lot to fear about the safety on our streets. The street seats also create jobs in a real way when you consider how many more customers it allows for businesses across the whole city. So please take that into consideration when looking at this program now and in the future. Hopefully there can be some money allotted through Prosper Portland or other means for businesses that have the space to create the street seat, but do not have the means to build one. Many restaurants continue to struggle and creating a path for those restaurants to enhance their site to build stronger business would be an amazing resource with tangible results. Um, and just a little side note, uh, 
our, our <coughs> street seat was activated two weeks ago on August 12th in a way that I hadn't even thought of uh, when the Boys and Girls Club um, was looking for uh, spots for their entrepreneurial lemonade day mm -hmm. program, which maybe you've heard of. Um, this was the first year they've done it and it, they're growing it big time next year. Um, and we were chosen as one of the sites and our street seat was like right on the sidewalk and just created this amazing atmosphere for on that Saturday afternoon. Um, so it was pretty sweet. Awesome, I'm gonna try not be a little bit redundant because I have a lot of the same words to say. <laughs> um, I'm here to underscore the Street Trust support for Peabot's outdoor dining program. Our organization is firmly behind city initiatives that not only bolster local businesses, but also cultivate thriving neighborhoods by optimizing the use of public space. Having actively engaged in Peabot's community's dining board and spoken with over a dozen businesses across the city since the start of the pandemic, I also have a column with Street Roots, so I've covered this issue there. I can say with confidence that this program, along with the Public Street Plaza program, has not only sustained beloved small businesses, it has ignited the imaginations of Portlanders who are looking for new ways to get more value out of the public right of way. I am one of those people. Um, after two years of dates, I uh, spent drinking wine at M Bar Shea Dining Area, waiting for coffee in front of the Commissary Cafe and sharing hummus and little Shalomial shelter. I proposed to my girlfriend, Sarah, three weeks ago uh, in the public plaza outside the Clinton Street Theater. Uh, we're really big Rocky Horror Picture Show fans. Um, fortunately, she said yes, uh, and we were able to celebrate <laughs> with champagne in another nearby outdoor dining area. It was great that it was outdoors because I was spilling a lot of the champagne. Um, it, it is incredible to think that only four years ago, the places that shaped my relationship with my fiance were nothing more than turn lanes and parking spaces. As fans of the outdoor dining program and believers in Peabot's role as caretakers of the public right of way, the Street Trust also wants to draw attention to the outdated funding mechanisms that make it so difficult for transportation agencies to start great programs like this one. Even as we celebrate this program, we are looking forward to the day when no community in Oregon has to, is asked to give up healthy businesses and vibrant streets uh, for parking revenue. Thank you. Uh, again, Jay Clark. The Portland Metro Chamber is supportive of the work that Peabot has outlined in this report of, for the outdoor dining program and the proposed new guidelines and updated fee schedule. Uh, we're pleased to see <coughs> that Portland's outdoor dining program is becoming a permanent and sustainable option available to our local businesses. First, I'd like to thank Peabot for being a good partner with the business community on this report. They have made a noticeable effort over the past six months to ensure that the voices of the business community were heard and represented. At the chamber, we worked with Peabot to share the public opinion survey that they previously mentioned, asking for direct feedback on this program. We hosted a listening session with our members and also Peabot presented to our small business council. Uh, they've also done an excellent job of keeping our staff informed as this has uh, progressed. Um, there are several aspects of this report that we at the chamber find favorable. First, the obvious safety. Uh, Peabot has expressed to me that, of course, the number one reason for the updated guidelines has to be safety, and we appreciate them never losing sight of that. Ensuring that these installations do not cause obstructions to street signage, bike lanes, or handicap accessibility must always be kept in mind. We're also very supportive of the multi-tiered fee structure that Peabot is proposing to go forward. Um, it goes without saying that so many of our local businesses, especially those in the central downtown, are struggling for a variety of reasons that I know everyone in this council is well versed on. Anything that we can do to allow more flexibility and options for our restaurants, bars, and broader small business community to thrive is, of course, wholeheartedly endorsed by our, our organization. We view the outdoor dining as yet another tool in the toolkit for local businesses, and we're pleased to see that the proposed new fee structure allows for more of a a la carte approach to permits so local businesses can better suit uh, what fits them and their needs. We're also pleased that Peabot will be proposing measures to help offset some of these costs in 2024 to help businesses transition from the drastically reduced COVA era fee structure to a more sustainable model. Um, outdoor cafes have become an essential addition to Portland's renewed neighborhoods and will now be a permanent fixture of Portland's livability. The Portland Metro Chamber considers this program an important piece in ensuring the economic stability of our local businesses and in the revitalization and full recovery of our central downtown. 
On a lighter note, we're also pleased that these guidelines will ensure quality aesthetics for these structures. What was once an emergency response uh, to surviving COVID is now turned into another kind of quirky trademark of Portland that both visitors and residents alike have noticed. We look forward to working with PBOT and the council as this moves forward, and thank you for your time. Does that wrap up? Fine. Great. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to move to public testimony. Do we have some? We have uh, one person signed up, Mary Seip. Welcome, Mary. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Am I too close to this? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, for the record, my name is Mary Seip and I am the chair of the city's noise review board and the, a past Pearl District Neighborhood Association board member. However, my comments today are not as a representative of the noise review board or the PDNA. I'm speaking as a community member, but most certainly drawing on my experiences in both of these positions. I do want to make it very clear that I strongly support this program and that my comments are simply suggestions um, to make you aware and also to make this even a better program. I understand that this report today is only about the outdoor dining program and that the Street Plaza program report will be presented to you later in the fall. However, my comments are applicable to both programs, so I ask that the City Commissioner, City Council, and PBOT keep that in mind. Some of the outdoor dining locations and the proposed existing street plazas such as one located on Northwest 13th Avenue, are in very close proximity to residential dwellings. A number of restaurants with the healthy business permits have installed speakers in their outdoor dining locations. Over the past two years, the Noise Office and the Noise Review Board have received complaints from neighbors about the disruption to their ability to work from home and just enjoy their homes due to the music playing from these speakers all day and late into the night. While the Noise Code Title 18 addresses some amplified uh, sounds, it's been challenging for the Noise Office to address amplified sounds in the right-of-way. Um, they often need the assistance um, under Title 14 from the Police Bureau. And as you know, their resources are very limited. On page 7 of the report, under Use and Operations, it states, amplified music may be prohibited and that a noise variance permit <coughs> Uh, is generally required for amplified music. I would like to suggest that the wording be changed to something like, installation of outdoor speakers is strictly prohibited at locations within 500 feet of residential dwellings, and that amplified music events must apply for a noise variance permit. This would avoid creating a problem for the noise office to attempt to address. Also, over the past two years, the community has struggled with some negative impacts with disorderly conduct in the public right-of-way where some of these outdoor dining areas or street plazas are located. There is a cluster of restaurants and bars along Northwest 13th Avenue where the street has been closed and there are two to three very large outdoor dining decks in the public right-of-way. Drunk and disorderly patrons by the hundreds congregate in the street, <clears throat> disturbing residents and making for a very unsafe situation. The owners of the restaurants can only manage customers within their restaurant. They cannot manage people in the public right-of-way. The city is responsible for making sure these locations are safe. A couple seconds. So PBOT, I would ask to work them to work with uh, Portland Police Bureau to establish some oversight at locations like on Northwest 13th Avenue. I do want to thank Sarah for reaching out to me yesterday when she saw that I had signed up for public testimony and helping to arrange a meeting with PBOT and the noise office and possibly at some point with the Portland Police Bureau to discuss how the city can ensure livability and safety for the community with these outdoor dining programs. Thank you, and I look forward to more productive conversations. Thank you, Mary. That wraps up public that testimony. testimony. Okay. Uh, that any more from the commissioner in charge, or should we just go into discussion? I, I think we can go into discussion. Okay. All right. Colleagues? Good? Good? Yeah. All right. Go ahead and call the, the roll. 
Oh, this is a report. Just uh, you want to ask for somebody to make a motion. Oh, so moved. Second it. Thanks. Okay. Gonzalez. I vote to accept. Max. Um, I just want to thank everyone who worked to get us to this moment. I'm really proud of the work that uh, has gone into this program and this presentation. Um, I hadn't really quite thought of it, um, or the presentations today really uh, uh, were powerful to me, uh, partly because uh, um, there truly are not many bright spots that come out of the pandemic, but it is truly, I think, fair and accurate to say that our outdoor dining program is um, a s truly special and innovative program that is part of what makes uh, post-pandemic Portland really great. Um, I also very much appreciate all of the uh, testimony we heard today from the public, especially the business owners, and I, 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 uh, it's powerful to also hear some of the concerns from residents too. Um, we pledge here at PBOT to work with you, uh, which is why I'm proud to vote aye. Thank you. Ryan. Yes, um, thank you all for being here. That was a really excellent report. And I have to say, the stories were compelling. It's hard to top the one that turned into a marriage. Um, but the fact is, I think we all have those stories of where we were cooped up and we finally got out to see a friend or a colleague. And you know, we'd start off with our mask on, then we had to eat. And suddenly, it just felt so good. So um, there aren't a lot of examples, I think, where we get compliments for being agile, responsive, creative turn something around quickly. And thank you, Peabot, you did all of that and more. And you did it with community, and you could really tell the partnerships were um, thorough with both the business community and with those that were frequenting the establishments. I thought the um, concerns that were lifted were ones that you're all addressing. I, I've heard from people with mobility challenges that, um, you know, we just don't have really wide sidewalks like New York City, for example. So we do have that challenge. And also the aesthetics and the improvements that we're, that we're working on. So anyway, I'm really proud of this program, and I do think that, um, like any good program, we have to keep evaluating it and keep approving it and making sure it's accessible to all small businesses because, again, your profit margins are very tight. We believe you, and we need you. I vote aye. Wheeler. Yeah, I want to thank the restaurant owners who came in today to testify and all the restaurant owners who worked really hard over the past several years to make this program a success. I want to thank the people at Peabot. This really was uh, our, our restaurant industry, our culinary industry coming together and showing a lot of innovation and a lot of determination, frankly, to outlast COVID. And it's a great program. And I agree with people who say this needs to be sustainable and affordable for all of the uh, for all the restaurants that, that are taking part in this particular program. Uh, so that's it. I'm happy to vote aye on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. And so it is passed. The report is passed. Thank you all for being here. It's great to have all the testimony and the community voice. Let's move on to the next item, which is 703. Ratify right. a... Ratify a successor collective bargaining agreement with Portland Police Association relating to the terms and conditions of employment of represented employees in the Bureau of Emergency Communications for 2023 through 2027. Okay. Thank you. Well, negotiating this um, collective bargaining Mary, you're one of you muted, perhaps. There we go. Okay, welcome. The floor is yours. Now, can you hear me? The oh, there are you. I'm going to hand this over to you. Yeah, okay, good. great. Well, Wasn't well, negotiating <laughs> collective bargaining agreement. Got it, Mayor. Parties. Go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. While negotiating this collective bargaining agreement, both parties negotiated with shared interests of strengthening recruitment as well as retention and accountability, expanded training, and improving the health and well being of represented employees within the Bureau of Emergency Communications. I believe we have Labor Relations Coordinator Anne-Marie Kavorki and Maddie, as well as Director Bob Kazi from the Bureau of Emergency Communications to walk us all through the ordinance. Welcome, Anne-Marie and Bob. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm pleased to present this ordinance to you this morning. Uh, again, I'm joined by Director Kazi and my Labor Relations colleague, Sydney Khan. 
Uh, this is an ordinance to ratify the successor collective bargaining agreement with the Portland Police Association representing the uh, terms and conditions uh, of uh, the employment of the represented employees in the Bureau of Emergency Communications, so our dispatchers. Uh, just a brief overview, I think the mayor highlighted already that uh, we had some shared interests, the first being a four-year labor agreement, uh, also strengthening recruitment and retention, strengthening accountability, expanding training, certifying new staff, and health and wellness of employees. So this agreement focuses on uh, all of those goals. Um, and allows for some additional premium pay incentives focusing on training and certification to highlight uh, that would be uh, an increase in the coach and lead premium pays, uh, an extension, uh, or excuse me, an accreditation pay which focuses on organizational excellence, uh, uh, a premium pay through the Department of Public Safety Standard Training for intermediate and advanced telecommunicator pay, uh, we also acknowledge the language differential pay that was adopted by ordinance a couple of years ago. will allow for a 2% across the board increase beginning in July of 2024, uh, as well as the double overtime extension previously approved by the council in July of this year. Um, we also made some additional adjustments to the language that shore up some accountability and uh, provide some uh, guidelines for how uh, investigations will, will take place in the Bureau. Um, PPA was an excellent collaborator, uh, collaborative partner as part of this process, and we committed to using shared interests to work through complex issues that the Bureau's been dealing with for the better part of decades. So I'm very proud of the relationship that we built and the good work done by both the BOIC uh, bargaining team, by the PPA's bargaining team, by BOIC ops management, including uh, the supervisors, and of course, uh, through our labor relations team. Uh, to get down to kind of brass tacks, the thing that people are most interested in is what is the cost of this? Uh, so the total recurring fiscal impact uh, and ongoing is approximately $1.3 million. That represents all ongoing costs uh, as of year four. Um, the the uh, costs associated for this will be paid for in part by the training pipeline dollars. Um, however, uh, and that gives BOIC a longer runway in covering some of the additional new costs associated, but this is not a sustainable solution, so I just wanna make that clear. The BOIC, uh, excuse me, the Bureau will request one-time comp set aside to help with an increase from COLA and the spring bump, and then we're also asking for council authorization uh, to direct the city budget office to adjust the current appropriation level target for fiscal year 24-25. Um, lastly, I just want to say again, thank you to the bargaining teams, the PPA, BOIC management and supervisors, and council uh, for the time, effort, and energy put into the successful completion of this agreement. And if you have questions, we're here to answer. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Mayor, are there any anything else? No, I don't know if we have public testimony or not. Yeah. No one signed up. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Keelan, go ahead and call the roll. Gonzalez. Uh, ecstatic this get resolved so timely. We've had a number of uh, successful uh, bargaining uh, experiences in recent months with our public safety professionals. I'm uh, so appreciative of the work done um, in our human resources team and our bargaining team and certainly leadership inside of BOAC. Um, this is a win for the city. It's uh, leading to significant investment in training, uh, some improvements in accountability, and uh, at a reasonable cost. I vote uh, wholeheartedly aye. Maps. Um, I want to congratulate and thank uh, BOIC, Bob, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, uh, um, the, uh, the PPA for negotiating this. I think these discussions might have begun when I was still um, at the table. I know it was challenging. I'm really impressed at the uh, way that folks came together to reach this really constructive and productive outcome. And colleagues, I'm not quite sure about this, but I believe once we pass this uh, uh, um, labor agreement right here, we might actually be caught up on uh, um, our labor negotiations, which in my two and a half years on council, I don't think that, I think that's the first time it's happened for me where we haven't had an ongoing labor negotiation in process. So this is a very exciting moment and I vote aye. 
Ryan. Uh, yes, I was looking at your face, Anne Marie, when <coughs> Commissioner Maps was saying that. So that's true. Uh, well, almost. We have the community <laughs> health division that's almost done with uh, Portland Fire, but yeah, but great. The, yes. All right. So well, anyway, close. I just want to say thank you, um, keyword team, for um, working this out, and I vote aye. Wheeler. Good work. I vote aye. Thank you. Thanks thank for being you. here. Yep. Okay, now we'll move on to 704, Keelan. Appoint Kim Lohr and Sean Wallace and reappoint Adam Ablanop to the Revenue Division Appeals Board. Mayor Wheeler. Colleagues, the Revenue Division Appeals Board hears and decides appeals of determinations issued by the Revenue Division. There are currently three vacancies on the board. This report reappoints one member and it appoints two new members to fill the vacancies. We have audit section manager Matthew Thorup here uh, to present the report as well as introduce our appointees. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you and good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I am Matthew Thorup. I use he, him pronouns and I'm the audit section manager with the Revenue Division. The mayor mentioned briefly the function of the board, but I wanted to provide more detail. The Revenue Division Appeals Board, formerly known as the Business License Appeals Board, is a five-member volunteer board comprised of members of the public. These three positions are appointed by the Commissioner in charge of the Revenue Division, subject to approval by City Council, and serve three-year terms with staggered end dates. Uh, the pandemic has created a disconnect in the terms, so these appointments are structured to fill the existing terms as if there were no interruption, and the Revenue Division intends to keep future board appointments current. When a business files their city business tax return, the revenue division will review or audit the filed return. When adjustments are needed to be made, the revenue division will propose corrections to the return and the taxpayer could protest these adjustments with the revenue division and explain why the return was correct as filed and provide additional support for their claim. If the revenue division does not accept the taxpayer's explanation or evidence, a final determination is issued by the Revenue Division, which include, will include a detailed explanation for the adjustments and the relevant code or law that supports the final determination. If the taxpayer still disagrees, they can appeal to the Revenue Division Appeals Board. The board will review the facts of the case, hear and review testimony, and then make a decision whether or not the Revenue Division's adjustments were correct. These decisions are final and there is no additional administrative appeals available. Since the Revenue Division also administers the city's transient lodgings tax, utility license fee, and clean energy surcharge, as well as the local business and personal taxes for Metro and Multnomah County, the Revenue Division Appeals Board may also review the cases for these programs. Portland City Code requires that appointments to the Revenue Division Appeals Board be made to provide an appropriate level of expertise in accounting methods and tax law, the three potential appointees meet the qualifications required by the code and should serve the per public, the city of Portland and our partner agencies well in any matters coming before the board. Today, I'd like to introduce the two new members to the board, Kim Lohr and Sean Wallace. Kim Lohr is a state and local tax principal with the LAP LLP, a local CPA firm, and she has 30 years of experience in state and local taxation. She has previously worked as a state auditor, the tax departments of several Fortune 500 companies, as well as two other accounting firms. She has a bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of Washington. She provides state tax education to various entities, including co-teaching a course on state taxation for the Washington State Tax Conference. She is interested in serving on the board to facilitate the timely resolution of appeals and assisting in the application of tax rules in an educated and impartial manner. She looks forward to using her expertise to help others in interpreting and understanding the tax rules and regulations. Sean Wallace is a shareholder at Perkins & Co., a Portland CPA firm. He has 13 years of progressive experience working as a CPA advising clients on federal, state, and local tax matters. His prior experience specific to local tax matters includes representing the Oregon Society of CPAs as an advisor on the implementation of the new Metro Supportive Housing Services taxes. He graduated from the University of Oregon with bachelor's degrees in Spanish and accounting. He is interested in serving on the board to have the opportunity to apply the knowledge he's gained working with the state and local tax codes to their fair and accurate application of the rules and regulations. 
The revenue division believes Kim and Sean would make excellent board members. I'll skip over the details for Adam Apple now, since he has a reappointment. But if you need more information, his biography and statement of interest is in your packets. Adam has served the public and city well in the past, and we strongly support his reappointment. Uh, the revenue division has done significant outreach uh, to conduct, uh, to uh, increase the diversity of this board. To meet the requirements of this position, this outreach has been targeted to individuals that have strong expertise in accounting, as well as federal, state, and local tax laws. We've worked with Timothy Penson in the Human Resources Department and reached out to local accounting and tax professional organizations, including the Oregon Society of CPAs, to specifically identify individuals that could add to the board's diversity. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Mayor, is there anything else? No. Okay. Uh, do we have Colleagues, do you, uh, is there any public testimony? Keep no one signed up. All right. Colleagues, do you have any questions or comments? No, but I would move that we accept the report. Uh, that's next. Uh, I was going to get there. Um, so anyway, if there's no more deliberation, can I ask for a motion to accept the report? So moved. All right. I'll second it. So no further discussion, Keelan. Go ahead and call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank Matthew for uh, that, well, the mayor and Matthew for bringing this forward. Matthew, I actually found your presentation uh, really helpful. This is not a space I know uh, particularly well. Also, really want to express my appreciation to Kim, Sean, and Adam for agreeing to serve on this important board. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, Matthew, thank you for that thorough presentation and stewarding this um, very important volunteer board. And thank you for the three hardworking volunteers that have stepped up. I vote aye. Wheeler. Matthew, thank you for bringing three really outstanding people for this. This is just great. I love it when we have such highly qualified people willing to serve on our boards. I want to thank our new appointees, Kim Lohr and Sean Wallace, for joining the board. And of course, uh, I want to thank Adam Aplanap for his continued service. I appreciate you all sharing your time and your talent, as well as your service to the city. I vote aye. Thank you. The report is accepted. And Keelan, uh, next item, please. Item 705, approve findings to authorize exemption to competitive bidding requirements and approve use of alternative contracting method of construction manager, general contractor, and authorized payment for construction of the North Portland Aquatic Center project. Thank you, Keelan. Colleagues, we've already received a presentation on this. This is the second reading. So if there's no further discussion, go ahead and call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Uh, Keelan, uh, that passes. Next item. Item 706, authorized contract with Place Studio LLC for North Park Blocks Extension Project not to exceed $1,367,074. Colleagues, this is also a second reading. We had a presentation last week. Um, if there's no further discussion, we can go ahead and call the roll. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. That passes. Everyone, uh, thank you for this morning's session. Uh, we had a little bit. Uh, oh, there's one more item that you pulled from consent. 700, right? Yeah. yeah. 700. Authorized Chief Procurement Officer to execute emergency security services contracts for smart park garages in a cumulative amount not to exceed $2,700,000. Um, colleagues, uh, this item was uh, pulled from consent by a member of the public. I'm going to pull it back to my office. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Maps. Okay, with that being said, that concludes this morning's session. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you at 2 o'clock. The session ended.